Good evening everyone, time for another member update. Now this is the silver chart. Um, it is the daily chart and the reason why I have it on the daily is I want to zoom in and show you when this action occurred. Now I've shown you before this trend line. I'm not going to put the arrows up because it's going to interfere with my ability to zoom. But uh, we, we had a decisive change in this trend line, and we're now going lower. We're at about 1650. Are we going to test new lows? Uh, very well could be, because there's some strange things going on here. Now, I think uh, anybody looking at this chart is going to notice the biggest standout here is this volume. So let's zoom in here. Now I've covered before, let's go out to the weekly, I've covered before how the volume in silver is increasing exponentially. It's going absolutely insane and you can see this recent volume is something like we've never seen before. But uh, let's get to the daily and zoom in and I'm going to show you where that volume comes in. So let's move in here and get right to it and you can see here that when we get to the daily with this first big spike here that comes in on November 8th so that's right at the election we get the the rally up huge volume move down and then we're continuing down so you can see we're putting in volume that has never been seen before this is unprecedented volume in silver now what is it volume in well it's volume in paper silver and what does that mean? That means that as this volume increases, the percentage of silver that is paper becomes larger. Because we know that silver eagles and silver maples and perth mint lunars and silver britannias and every other silver coin that's out there is not what is counted in this number. This number is futures contracts traded back and forth between all of the big players. And you can see that just since the election, they've actually had to double. We've gone from a roughly 30 million here daily average, which was uh, already high because you can see that the uh, 30 million spike top started this year to where we would top out around 30 million in these spikes. Prior to that, 20 million was the top, and the only time we saw something like that before was back in 2015 when we were trying to get a rally. So now we are running double the volume. Well, what does that mean? It means they've doubled down. It means that they have doubled up their position again. It's something like the national debt. We know that uh, the national debt has doubled uh, under Obama and if Trump doesn't want to go out as um, the guy who caused the next big recession then it may just double under Trump as well and then we're talking about 40 trillion dollars now let's use that to segue into the bond market because this is a big uh, thing that's starting to take form here and uh, I'll, we're going to start with a 30-year bond. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And you can see, based on a trend analysis, that uh, the 30-year is nowhere near the support line, which runs like this. But it has had a huge reversal. Now, it's more uh, significant as we move in on the yield curve. If we move to the 10-year note, you can see that it's starting to get testing of that we'll still need some good moves down to get a broken trend but that's possible moving into the five-year note you can see here that it's still a ways from long-term support and then the closest one out is going to be the euro dollar which is a kind of a mirror image of the t-bill and you can see that uh, rates have been rising but not significantly there's kind of a little bit of an uptick so we know with the state of the debt that an increase in interest rates is going to mean bankruptcy for the government so what are they going to do well 
I wanted to take a look at what's going on in India because this may be a precursor to what happens here. The stuff that's going on in India right now is absolutely mind-boggling. They are, for want of better words, it's like they, they're trying to burn their economy down to the ground. And when we look at the numbers here, I until I investigated this, I had no idea that the numbers were this bad. We're not talking about eliminating big banknotes. We're talking about eliminating basically all banknotes uh, that have really any value. We're going to see that when we look at the story. But let's jump over and look at the rupee chart. Now, if you remember, uh, we had a long history of India trying to fight the natural instinct of the Indian citizens to stockpile gold and hoard gold. We know that they have traditions in their families where the brides have gold chains and gold jewelry and that's their wealth and that's something that runs back thousands of years. It's something that's very difficult for the government to counter and the government there institute a policy of putting very very high tariffs on gold and that actually resulted in the election of their new, I think it was Prime Minister, President, whatever they call him. And he was a pro-gold guy. But now we see them doing a very strange thing. And this is this strict cash ban. And like I said, it's wreaking havoc on the Indian economy. But I wanted to put the lines in here because you can see just looking at the chart we go this goes this is a long-term chart this goes all the way back to 1998 with the rupee at about 36 we're basically doubled from that so that's a having of the value of the currency and we were close to that during the financial crisis so essentially since the financial crisis started the indian rupee has lost half its value but even more disturbing than that you can see that the trend here Fairly clearly, you can see the trend was broken, but then extended, that we're starting to form kind of this pennant formation in the rupee. And that is a very, very bearish formation. That's uh, projecting something like 100 to 1. And that is a serious devaluation. So ever since the government of India started fighting against gold hoarding by their citizens, their citizens have been proven right and the government has been proven wrong. So let's look at the story here. This is from Zero Hedge. Indian economy grinds to a halt after cash ban. Faith in the system is shaken. Amid scenes of panic across India following PM Modi's shock decision to withdraw high-value bills in the middle of the sewing and wedding season, Reuters reports the move aimed at cracking down on the shadow economy. This is the excuse they always use. They will always cite crime. They will always cite uh, tax evasion because they want to control everything. The truth is that... uh, these things have gone on for a very long time and they're actually one of the healthiest aspects of economies is the the free market that operates in the shadows but governments that want to control everything hate that and i think that india i'm going to read this and then explain why india is going to be a precursor of what they're going to try to do uh worldwide Cracking down on the shadow economy has brought India's cash economy to a virtual standstill. With over 90% of all transactions done in cash, money flows in and out of the black and white system. Until now, as Devangshu Dada exclaims, quote, The system works because everybody believes that those pieces of paper will be accepted by everybody else. This move has shaken that trust. Farmers have been left stranded as traders have no cash to pay for their produce while millions of Indians lined up outside of banks and post offices for the ninth day to exchange old bank notes or withdraw ration money from their accounts. And there's a video you can watch. There's a lot on this. Many of India's 260 million farmers have no bank accounts and depend on local money lenders to fund sowing which means those that have to borrow to sow winter crops like wheat or rapeseed 
could face debt trouble without a good harvest. And so India's government on Thursday announced intermediate steps to ease a cash crunch for farmers amid widespread criticism. In the latest in a series of ad hoc steps, Modi allowed farmers to withdraw up to 25,000 rupees, $368 a week, against their crop loans to ensure that sowing of winter crops takes place properly, a senior ministry finance official said. But as Devang Shudata explains, the demonetization of uh, rupee 500 and rupee 1000 currency notes came as a surprise to almost everyone. The details of remonetization are still to become entirely clear. What follows is a set of personal opinions of likely outcomes arising from this move to demonetize. Each of those opinions could be entirely wrong, but they are all centered on subjects that are worth thinking about. But first, some basic statistics. About 85% of all currency in circulation has just been turned into coupons that can only be exchanged in specified places. These notes can be converted into currency again only with identity proofs which hundreds of millions don't have and the additional hardship of standing in many queues for many hours. Over half of India's population doesn't have any sort of bank account at the moment and about 300 million don't have basic ID such as Aadhaar either and hence cannot access the banking system at all. About 130 million Indians have mobile wallets. About 25 million have credit cards. There may be 550 to 600 million debit cards in circulation. So access to cash is very, very important for average Indians. Liquidity in the economic system will be sucked out for several weeks at the very least due to the very stringent restrictions on cash withdrawals from ATMs and bank accounts. Plus, there's the sheer logistics of getting that massive volume of new notes into circulation. In addition, there will be the cost of printing and distributing the new notes and taking the old currency out of circulation. India is a cash economy. Well over 90% of all transactions are done in cash. Most of these transactions are legal, consisting of relatively small amounts and frequently done by people who don't make enough money to pay income tax. Your domestic worker pays for her bus ticket. You pay her husband, the plumber, for fixing your flush. The security guard at the bank ATM buys cigarettes. Money flows in and out of the black and white system. The pawn walla pays the fast-moving consumer goods companies for the cigarettes and chewing gum he sells and keeps the retail margin. That's white. He plows the surplus cash into buying pawn leaves in undocumented transactions. The farmer who grows the pawn pays no tax. The trader who sells the pawn underreports the transaction. That's black. The mechanic who is outside of the tax net receives an undocumented tip for changing a flat tire and buys a metro token, putting cash back into the government coffers, or goes to see a movie paying a service tax. Industries like fashion, retail, interior decoration, furniture, laundry and dry cleaning services, hospitality, medical services, gems and jewelry, etc. are large conduits for these flows. We could call them black and white industries. Construction and real estate are totally built around black and white. Land is always sold with part of the price being paid in cash. The real estate developer buys in black and white and he sells in black and white. The construction process is also black and white. Carrying ghost workers on the construction rolls is one easy way to generate black money, for example. These are the facts. Slow down in growth. And now for some estimates and opinions. By all estimates, the size of the black economy in India is large and the undocumented informal but legal economy is also large. Estimates range from 20% of official gross domestic product to 40% of official gross domestic product. Many assets are held in the form of real estate and jewelry or other assets stashed abroad in bank accounts or real estate, etc. However, political parties and religious bodies tend to hold trunkfuls of physical cash and some cash-intensive businesses also have large floats sitting around. Now we come to opinions. The informal economy will be badly impacted. 
the non-cash assets will remain but those will be frozen for a while and then it will be difficult to convert those assets immediately cash assets will need to be laundered in some fashion maybe by opening religious trusts and trustees donating notes to the trust etc and will probably incur massive discounts in conversion there will be black market conversions to hard currencies and bullion with rupee notes being accepted at massive discounts Anecdotal conversations suggest that the United States dollar is now trading at a 15% premium to the Reserve Bank of India rate. All the black and white and cash trend, cash intensive industries will be impacted for a while by the liquidity freeze. So will other industries with high cash turnovers such as roadside vegetable sellers. This will show up in serious economic underperformance and a slowdown in GDP growth. The slowdown in GDP growth will not be completely captured in official statistics, but there will be signs for sure in terms of consumption falling, etc. And it goes on. Great article. There are other articles on this as well. So what's going on? Well, I want to show you another article here, and this is how India is taking the lead in identity uh, tracking. And so it's not surprising to me that we're seeing the same thing happening in a country that is being, that I would say the new world order is testing for cashless system and identity system. Those go hand in hand. So this is a story from June of 2012 about the identity scheme in India. In an audacious technical mission, India is building a near foolproof database of personal biometric identities for nearly a billion people, something that has never been attempted anywhere in the world. Poor Indians who have no proof to offer of their existence will leapfrog into a national online system, another global first, where their identities can be validated anytime, anywhere, in a few seconds. India will outdo the world's biggest biometric databases, including those of the FBI and the U.S. Visit Visa Program, says Nidand N- Nilakani, the technology tycoon who heads the program properly called by its acronym UIDAI. The United States Visa Program is a biometric database of 120 million. In comparison, the UIDAI has already registered 200 million members less than two years after the first enrollment. By 2014, half of India's population will have an identity tagged to a random, unique 12-digit number. And we're talking about facial recognition. We're talking about eye scans. We're talking about fingerprints. So we're talking about the New World Order. We're talking about, well, Christians speculate the mark of the beast. That's been around for a long time. But you can see that's an old story. So India seems to be on the front burner for the New World Order. And we're seeing now uh, with the fake news story, defunding stories uh, with social media, there, uh, as I pointed out, it seems like maybe Trump is attacking the media. We don't know what's going to happen yet. We have to recognize that we're only a week after the election and Trump is just starting to name people. I believe he just recently named Jeff Sessions, which is very encouraging for me that he would uh, name a strict hardline conservative to the attorney general. But if you remember, Jeff Sessions was one of the only Republicans who stepped up and endorsed Trump early on. So that's not really surprising, kind of a political reward. But uh, we're seeing a lot of things coming down the pike Uh, right after the election. So this fits in with the scenario that I was talking about, that I expect something big to happen. I have predicted for quite some time that Trump would win, and I also have thought that perhaps Trump would be the bankruptcy president. Uh, Maybe that will happen, maybe it won't. It's interesting, though, that we see that uh, they have chosen the election to be the time where they're doubling down on their paper silver bets and uh, can they push it to new lows? Yeah, they probably can. Uh, We'll have to keep a close eye on compare silver prices, the uh, price of spot versus uh, the price of the coins and uh, possible shortages emerging, but they are uh, 
doubling down again on this system and now India is the test case for the New World Order to see if they're going to put up with this. Uh, the last thing I wanted to comment about is why it would be India. Now India is a country that fell under British rule. Uh, you know the saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire. So the British had a very, very large empire. We know the story about Gandhi and everything else. But Britain had a very large influence on India. And uh, the language was very much affected. There's a tremendous number of English-speaking Indians. That's one of the reasons why we have so many Indians in tech support, although they're, trust me, from doing my everyday work with them, their English leaves much to be desired. But they definitely speak English and they are very technical and mathematical. And so the British had a very large impact on their culture, but they did not have a religious impact. And for the most part, India is still... Uh, an Eastern religion based country, whether it's Hinduism or Buddhism or Sikh or some Islam, it's not what you could call a Christian country, something that we can compare to the United States. And the reason why that's important is because in the United States, we are the premier country based on the Western ideals that come from Christianity, the philosophy of John Locke and to some extent Hobbes and, uh, um, I can't remember all the names of the important philosophers who influenced the Western tradition of rights and the Magna Carta, etc. But we have a tradition of, of individual rights here, and the basic concept is that they come from God. Now, it was very good to see Trump come out and mention the Second Amendment and mention that uh, those rights actually supersede governments. That was very encouraging. Now, when we look at India, this is not a tradition that is that they have over there. You have to remember that the religious tradition of Hinduism and this sort of, uh, I would call it, my term would be defeatist determinism, in that uh, if you're living in the gutter and you're an untouchable, then that's that the reason that's your fate is because that's what you deserve, because that's what you did in a past life, etc. So this is a culture of people who are, in my opinion, much more likely to accept a imposition of the latest fad that the New World Order would like to push. And I think that's probably the primary reason they're English-speaking, they're westernized to, uh, westernized to a certain extent, but they don't have that Western individual civil liberty type of perspective to resist this. And I honestly would expect there to be riots and bankers hanging from lampposts and politicians being thrown on burning piers. <laughs> but that's not happening. So it looks like the New World Order has chosen India as their test case to see if they can push a cashless society, how far they can push it, how much damage they can do before people react. And it's very sad, but uh, this is what's coming Major changes are going to come with this new administration. We have no idea what's going to happen yet, but I stand by my old predictions that big fireworks are going to come uh, as a result of this, this election, and we'll talk to you next time.